Folks, happy Sunday. I hope you have a beautiful extended weekend planned out for you. I know that we do as well. Let us begin this time of celebration with prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, creator and redeemer, open the doors of heaven. Pour forth that furious wind. Silence our hearts and then teach us how to speak again. Amen. I want to tell again the story of Pentecost in more depth, add some context so that I hope that it can be a little bit more comprehensible to us today. So this was an event that happened, it had been happening for many, many years. It was a Jewish custom to come together on that day and share food. And so there was that holiday 2,000 years ago. It was an occasion when people who spoke different languages and they ate different kinds of food and they followed different traditions, they all gathered in one common place. Now they ate with their own families and they tended to share bread and wine with the folks who had traveled with them to celebrate Pentecost. Surely they sat and they studied their neighbors, the people who were different. It was uncommon in that day and age to encounter people from different communities and cultures, those who spoke different languages. They probably maybe looked on at their neighbors with some curiosity. Some, I'm sure, with envy. Some with suspicion. But by needs, they gathered at this one place. This house is what the Bible describes it as, but it was likely a big gathering hall, just like this. It was the only place that they had. Remember, they were traveling to a city that was under a brutal military occupation. So by needs, they gathered in this one place. Now they'd learned over the course of generations and having come to this event, as they were children up through the years, they'd learned to share the space with those people who were different from them. I suspect probably they kept their children close Uh, Perhaps the more gentle-hearted with them shared some food with these strange neighbors, offering a mute smile and an open hand. You know how it is when you go on a trip and you're journeying with somebody who doesn't speak your language and you don't speak their language and you you want to be gracious and kind. It's a challenge. But I'm sure that in any case, as they ate, the noise in that space, as you can imagine, probably grew. It got louder. Maybe it was kind of a cacophony. It was an unrefined and dissonant chorus of languages. But they'd grown used to it at this point. When I was blessed to spend time in Tizay, France, the monks of that uh, monastery would lead us all in worship. And their hymnals uh, were printed in dozens of different languages. We all sang the same hymns, but we sang them in our own languages. The person next to you might be singing in Polish. They might likewise be singing in Japanese or Mandarin. But these wonderful monks had written out the cadence of the hymns in each language so that our voices, what we sang in our own tongues, they wove together. It was a very beautiful sound. I would say not unlike the sound of a pipe organ. It was a cacophony, though, at times. But I suspect back 2,000 years ago, as the time passed, the divisions between these groups might have grown deeper. People who were suspicious of particular groups probably sat further away from those groups. They were sitting maybe far away from each other as they could. And the ones with money, Well, they can always use their money to keep other people away from their tables. That's the way of the world. And everybody could see that this wasn't sustainable. Eventually, the room was going to fill up. And eventually, something would snap. And so those with the means to do so continued to push the poorest of the strangers into these smaller and smaller corners. And then something did happen. Something that everyone could see coming, but that nobody had the courage to avoid despite the fact that they were all in a shared place, despite the fact that this was their holiday, the holiday of Pentecost was the same holiday that they all shared, despite the fact that they all knew 
better. I suspect that perhaps some violence erupted somewhere in that room. Oh, they knew who they were. Well, but perhaps they had placed someone else's humanity below their own. Perhaps fights broke out. Perhaps there was a fire or smoke filled the room. The anger in the strangers' faces became comprehensible. It was the same fear, the same frustration. Someone shouted out in their native tongue, why can't we fix this broken system? And the others couldn't understand them. Why became this cry from the suffering people? And then in what seemed like an instant, they all began to understand. They began to comprehend that the suffering of their scarcity, the suffering of their sense of containment was a result of the people who had authority and power refusing to take responsibility for those who had no power. And it was the Holy Spirit that worked to then shatter that illusion. This was the illusion, the cobwebs, the haze that the Spirit began to clear from their eyes. This is the prophecy of Joel. That they were different. That they were Parthians and Elamites. That they were Romans. That they were Asians and Arabs. That they were those things first and children of God second. But suddenly when the Holy Spirit broke that illusion and shattered that lie, they knew with deep and holy comprehension that what they were first was human beings. They stopped seeing these different nations of origin, these different cultures, and they saw people. They saw that they were children of God. And suddenly someone in that room began to laugh. And another, and another, laughing together. Laughter, the universal language. They laughed and the tears rolled down their faces as this epiphany spread from person to person. This terrifying riot changed into laughter. How blind they'd been, how foolish, how selfish, how pointlessly selfish. My God, look at all the food we have, they thought. The space, the joy gathered together, not under the illusion that they were Americans and Mexicans and Chinese and Nigerians and Canadians. No, that they were something much simpler, in fact. They were human creatures, children of God. And then there was a sweet, sweet spirit in that place. And they knew it was the spirit of the Lord. There were sweet expressions on each face. And they knew that it was the presence of the Lord. The joy spilled over into the streets. The joy of that Pentecost spilling out of that building. But out there in the streets were yet other people. Now they hadn't seen what had happened in that room. And they knew who they were, first of all, not human beings. These people, these others, who were out in the streets, who hadn't participated in that shared moment of joy and laughter, they mocked the people who were singing and dancing. And they said, these people are drunk. <laughs> but I think some of the others said, these people are naive. They said, these people have no common sense. And one of them, a very courageous man, a very strong man, a man who had come into his own relationship with God at various points in his life, a man named Peter. He had the courage to stand up and address the cynics who were outside of the building. He said, no. No, in fact, what you're seeing is the world to come. It's God's vision for the world, what you're seeing. And we are now the world builders. We're the image bearers. We're the liberators. We'll win. Well, it's been 2,000 years since that event. It still feels like we've got a long ways to go to get close to winning. A great deal of blood is shed over lines, imaginary lines drawn on paper. And today, the mockers and the cynics out in the streets, they use different words. They use words like, well, it's human nature. Or they'll use words like 
cultural depravity. They use the words of scientific racism to try and suss out who these different people are. And sometimes under capitalism, they, were, they use words like contributors and liabilities. How can you imagine a human being as a liability? What madness that is. Some of them seem to love the distances between us, the barriers enforced by wealth and violence. And as we have uh, surpassed the unimaginable horror of over a million American lives lost to the coronavirus, a million American lives, I see some people still saying of those who we've lost, oh, they were predominantly elderly people. They were predominantly sick people anyway. They weren't contributing to the economy. <laughs> I saw a... Uh, 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 a politician, someone in a seat of power, was referring to the people who grow our food and build our cities as human capital stock. You see, the barriers that they've put up, the ones they've invented, they're important to them. For some of them, these barriers, these made-up identities, allow them to do something profitable. Very difficult to reason a man out of a position that his paycheck depends upon. I think Thomas Paine probably said that. It allows them to turn a human being into a commodity. The United States of America, as we know, with its formidable wealth and infrastructure, this country was built by people who were enslaved. This is an indisputable fact. It's an economic reality. Slavery has taken on many different forms throughout history. But one of the mo I think the most pernicious form that it ever took was the chattel slavery of the American South. Those wealthy white landowners had discovered a way, they figured out a way to force some Americans to work their entire lives without paying them a penny. And, and then not only work without pay, because we often think about the brutal uh, physical labor of chattel slavery, but often unexamined is that these Americans under slavery were forced to think without pay. They weren't even compensated for their faculties of reason. They found a way, these wealthy white landowners, they found a way to extract wisdom and industry and invention and brilliance and art and music and poetry and childcare and other things from these people. They found a way to get all of these things out of them for free. And they did it by arbitrarily declaring that some Americans were not human beings. And so by doing this, they turned them into oxen, to sheep for the shearing, into private property, into commodities, into human capital stock. But the problem was that they knew, they knew the people who tried to own the other people. They knew, uh, whether explicitly or implicitly, that this was a lie. It was not a reality. It was a powerful lie, but it was a lie upon which their massive fortunes depended. And they knew that it is not in the nature of a human being to be made into property. So they created uh, these things that were called slave patrols to run around and, and, and enforce this at the end of a baton or a bullwhip or a pistol. These slave patrols were one of the earliest systems of policing in America. The owners of these people, the owners of people, what a ridiculous concept. They lived in fear that they, these people would revolt and take what was rightfully theirs. The homes they'd built for free, the crops they'd harvested without pay, that they would take back their children that had been stolen from them. Hundreds of years of white people looting the storehouses of black Americans. They would demand what was theirs. So the slave patrols were created with exactly one purpose, to control, by any means necessary, the freedom of these people who had been enslaved. And these slave patrollers, they gave them a paycheck and they put a badge on their chest. I saw uh, the badges of the slave patrols when I was in Atlanta. And I read the words of the oath that these first slave patrollers would take. They would take an oath of office and they would say the following oath. I do swear that I will as a searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, 
faithfully and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. It was the slave patroller's oath in North Carolina in 1828. Then they were not private mercenaries. They were paid for by the state through tax dollars. They were paid by the government. And a huge part of their job was stopping and questioning these black Americans about where they were going, where they were coming from, checking their papers, and meeting out physical punishment. The great historian, American historian Sally Hayden, uh, writes in her important work on the history of slave patrols, she writes that the history of police work in the South grows out of this early fascination by white slave patrollers with what African American slaves were doing. Most law enforcement was, by definition, white patrolmen watching, catching, or beating black slaves, end quote. Well, that was the South. Well, what about the North? What was policing in the North? And there were police in the North in the early 1800s, and they served a very similar function, um, but to a bit of a different end. In the early 1800s, uh, the, the centralized municipal police forces were created in northern cities, but they didn't exist to prevent crime or solve crimes, they were there to control working class people, to control immigrants mainly, anybody who was below the threshold of a certain amount of wealth. Um, the first northern police forces were overwhelmingly white male and focused on responding to disorder. disorder. They were riot patrols really, meant to quell any kinds of protests or public demands by the poor. Uh, as Eastern Kentucky University criminologist Gary Potter explains, officers were expected to control a quote-unquote dangerous underclass that included African Americans, immigrants, and the poor. And through the early 20th century, there were basically no standards for hiring or training officers. Okay, so we find out that the history of those same mockers, the same people standing outside that first Pentecost. Um, the standard bearers for reinforcing the divisions amongst people, uh, they include, they've always included the use of state violence to oppress and brutalize and, and, and even murder poor people. The working people, the people with the hands that built this nation. We've seen in the news, story after story after story, of someone who is suspicious of another person, and so they, if they're a white person, typically, unfortunately, they pull out their cell phone and they do what? They call the police, call 911. The wealthy at that day of Pentecost, what lengths would they go to to maintain their power, their position? in the hierarchy of this system of wealth that existed in Rome. You know, in the kingdom of God, there's no hierarchy of this kind. Jesus he, he puts it pretty plainly. Jesus says it's very difficult for the wealthy to enter into the kingdom of God. Not because they're bad people, and not because wealth in and of itself is inherently bad, though the love of wealth can be a sickness but it's because they're irrationally afraid of what they, life would look like if they lost some of the wealth that they had. Now the real tragedy for those of us who have felt the wind of Pentecost, who have received the Ruach, the breath of Jesus Christ, who have taken on the mantle of discipleship, that, who've learned to speak in tongues, for those of us who've experienced this world that Peter's describing, and we know that it is a better world. It's better in every way. Inside that room where everyone is filled with joy and sharing and love, being in there is better. It's a better system than what's out there. And we know that it's a better way of living than we could ever hope to purchase with earthly wealth. No amount of wealth is going to buy your way into that Pentecost celebration. It's a, it's a tragedy when somebody suspicious of another person for no reason, decides to call on the police to investigate them. This is why we have to really work to suss out um, 
this specter of white nationalism, white racism in America. It's bad for us. It hurts everybody. Um, the system of summoning state violence in order to punish somebody is exactly what Peter is responding to in that moment of Pentecost. Now, it's a system that's predicated on the idea that uh, I am a person and you are not. Mm, okay. White folks, as plainly as I can put this, when you call the police on a black person, I want you to understand that you're, 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 you're calling down a terrible, a terrible power. You're summoning the power of death on a human being made in the image of God. Be very careful with that. Can we fix this system? It's... Can people be made well? I'll borrow a line from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Is there any medicine sufficient to heal our sick white brothers? I believe so. I think so. And I think it is this very same breath of God, the wind of Pentecost. To the people who say that Americans will never be one in the spirit, it's just human nature. We need to double down on enforcement of barricades. Those people exist today. Some have given up hope. Some say nothing will ever change. But I don't really believe that. I don't. I have my own hopes. I believe in a Pentecost where being a human, a child of God, is the first and most beautiful common denominator. When we make this choice, the un somewhat unique and stunning array of differences between us become different garments, different colors of a single garment that we're all wearing. We stop colonizing and changing and forcing people into a single monoculture of Americanism or whiteness or whatever. And instead we see a human being. We become people seeing other people. Everything that we've seen over the past few years, this terrible violence, the violence of the coronavirus, stole a million lives away from us. The violence of white nationalism and white Christian nationalism that is brutalizing and stealing away the bodies and lives of our black brothers and sisters, all of it, this rage, is the inheritance, the psychological inheritance of centuries of theft and looting and violence and oppression. The theft of property, labor, and intelligence from black people. Now, I have shared this message before in a different context and in a different setting and someone approached me and they were very bothered by my insistence that the people who were bound in slavery in the South, that I continuously refer to them as Americans. They were enslaved Americans from the very second they set foot on American soil. In America, a very central part to this experiment that we call America is that we believe our rights come from God and not the government. Okay, so if you're standing on American soil, you're an American. You have rights. The Constitution applies to you. Constitutional protections are intended to apply to all standing on American soil. Those slave patrollers, just like the people today who hate immigrants, who despise the 2.3 Americans currently incarcerated in prison, the modern day chattel slaves. They, they believe that our rights come from the government. They want you to show a government ID in order to vote or to walk freely down the street or sit peacefully in a park. They want, uh, they want the poor to think that their rights come from the pleasure of the United States government instead of from God. And the president, people who, who sign their paychecks. Sometimes they'll even say if you're an immigrant, and this is truly baffling, if you're an immigrant, they'll say you've got no rights because you don't have that special piece of paper from the government that has the word citizen written on it. A special piece of paper that most of us got just by being born. 
Well, Americans, they're wrong. Our rights come from God. And every single person who's been enslaved in this country, either as the chattel of wealthy white landowners in the South, or as wards of the current privately owned prison systems, or in custody because of DHS and ICE, every single American who's been detained and searched without reason by the police, every single person who's been assaulted or executed in the streets without a fair trial, these people have had their God-given rights violated. And it's left to us to analyze what the appropriate response is. Kindred, this is Pentecost Sunday, and I didn't ask you to listen to these words in order to hurt you or, or make you feel ashamed or feel bad about yourself or, or anyone else, but they're important. I want to give you an opportunity to choose again today, right now, to be a people of Pentecost. People who, when they saw division, they, instead of reinforcing those boundaries, sowed into that division the power of laughter, the universal language, love, generosity, mercy. A people who, when they saw the powerful out in the streets, ready to use violence and wealth to keep those people in their place, rejected that message. And like Peter, loudly and publicly decried this crooked system, and say, this isn't the way that God has it. But most of all, if I could do anything on this very special day of Pentecost, it would be to open your eyes to the breathtaking beauty of the individual story of every other human being that you encounter. One of the most important practices that we cultivate as pastors, as clergy, so that we're, we're aware, awake, and paying attention, is to understand that every single human life is a fascinating story of miracles and adventures and, and, and spellbinding love. Every story, not just the ones that get written down in the books, every human being that you meet is a Hollywood blockbuster that you haven't seen or heard yet. Every single human has seen things that are going to captivate your attention if you just stop and listen to their story. Open your mind, your heart to the powerful stories, the victories, the tragedies, the journeys of every other human being that you meet on your brief trip through this life. That is a lovely way to live in the world. You might even stop watching TV altogether. <laughs> you can choose. You can choose to do this. You take sides. I take sides. I do all the time. I'm no less a patriot if I criticize my country or its history. In fact, oftentimes the most patriotic thing to do is to criticize your beloved country. And I'm not a radical for telling the truth about this sickness of racism in America. I'm just a man who wants to be in that room, that room where the people were laughing and sharing food and dancing and, and singing songs in different languages that I don't understand. Because I, I may not understand their language, but it doesn't mean that I'm surrounded by strangers or immigrants. I'm just in a room with human beings. That sounds very pleasant to me. It's a room where I am not judged by how much money I make. It's a room where I can look them in the eyes and I know that they, say, they see me as a human, as a human being and a child of God. Well, I know that out there, especially the people in power and the people on TV, are, like, they mock us for believing that we can do this impossible thing. But kinfolk, we don't have to worry about that because Jesus Christ has breathed on us. We have it on his authority to believe in impossible things. Endlessly. For though we don't know how long it will take to get there, for though we don't know how long it will take to get there, we can be most assured of the destination. That victory is absolutely secure. So, Pentecost, eyes forward, hands on the gospel plow. Amen. Amen.